The Epilepsy Foundation is pleased to share with you an educational webinar, Know Your Epilepsy. The mission of the Epilepsy Foundation is to lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. Tonight's educational webinar is brought to you with support from Neuropace. My name is Dr. Elaine Kiriakopoulos, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us this evening. I'd like to review with you the format for tonight's webinar. During the speaker presentations, all phone lines will be muted. We would like to encourage everyone to submit their questions at any time during the webinar. To do so, type your questions into the question window on the GoToWebinar panel and click Send. We will read your questions aloud during the question and answer portion of the webinar. Please keep your questions general in nature as the webinar is intended for educational purposes. This webinar does not take the place of individual medical advice. This webinar will be recorded and available for viewing and listening on epilepsy.com. The Epilepsy Foundation is working to provide information and education that serves the spectrum of individuals and families impacted by epilepsy. Often, when you have a question about your health or your loved one's health, you may hear or read things that you are not sure quite how to interpret. The Foundation's webinar education series aims to bring together expert clinicians and scientists who can share with you up-to-date and accurate information to help answer your questions. Tonight's webinar will highlight the benefits of getting to know your epilepsy. It is important to feel empowered and active in managing your epilepsy. Understanding your diagnosis is critical to having good communication with your medical team and working towards the goal of freedom from seizures. Building your epilepsy knowledge ensures you are able to engage in making decisions about the way your seizures are treated and may also help to lower the risks associated with seizures. Finding your voice and feeling empowered will allow you to direct your epilepsy journey and to share with those around you how to best support you. Epilepsy and the challenges it brings can make it feel like you're facing a steep climb sometimes. We hope that tonight you will hear throughout this webinar that you are not alone in your climb. There are people who can support you and help you to reach your goals. And when you do reach your health goals, we hope you will take the time to celebrate and know that the people who support you are right there with you. They're celebrating your resilience and your achievement of reaching your goal of the best health possible. A good place to start working towards your goal of the best health possible is to position yourself where you can build a network of support. It is so important to make the time to stop and, stop and think about where you are in your epilepsy journey and how you can build a cushion of support around you. Some of those key supports will include your epilepsy care providers, but also your primary care doctor and other specialists. You can build additional support through engaging with your epilepsy community, your peers, and your own circle of family and friends who you feel will be there to lend a hand when you need it and to celebrate your successes with you as well. I'm so very honored to introduce to you our guests and speakers for this evening. Dr. Allison Pack is an Associate Professor of Neurology at Columbia University Medical Center in the Division of Epilepsy. Upon graduating with her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania, she completed residency training in neurology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Following her residency, she trained as a clinical fellow in epilepsy at the Columbia Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at New York Presbyterian Hospital. After completing fellowship in 2000, she joined the faculty at Columbia University Medical Center. 
She received her MPH with a concentration in epidemiology from the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health in 2010. Dr. Pack has focused her career on clinical care for epilepsy patients, clinical research, and educating future generations of neurologists and epilepsy specialists. She is an inductee into the Columbia University Bagalos College of Physicians Academy of Clinical Excellence. Within the Epilepsy Center at Columbia, she is the director of the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit and co-director of the Epilepsy Surgery Program. Her research has focused on effects of anti-epileptic drugs on bone and mineral metabolism, as well as the care of women with epilepsy, including studies among pregnant women and contraceptive practices in women with epilepsy. In 2012, she received the American Academy of Neurology Neuroendocrine Research Award. Dr. Pack established and is the director of the Epilepsy Fellowship Program. Dr. Pack was chair of the neuroendocrinology section of the American Academy of Neurology between 2014 and 2018, and is currently a member of the American Academy of Neurology Guideline Development, Dissemination, and Implementation Subcommittee. She also serves, and we are fortunate to have her serve, as the secretary of the National Professional Advisory Board of the Epilepsy Foundation. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Pack. Allison Kukla is the Population Health Coordinator at the Norfolk Department of Public Health in Virginia. She coordinates the district's community health improvement activities, including the planning, implementation, and evaluation of the Community Health Improvement Plan. She engages with stakeholders and community members to organize community outreach events and programs throughout Norfolk. From 2010 through 2017, she worked as a political appointee for the Obama administration in both the White House at the Office of Public Engagement and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency at the Office of Children's Health Protection. Allison was diagnosed with epilepsy as a college freshman in 2006. Since then, she has become an active advocate volunteering with various epilepsy organizations, foundations, and nonprofits. In May of 2018, she became a member of the Epilepsy Foundation of Virginia's Professional Advisory Board. Allison is originally from Youngstown, Ohio, and has a bachelor's degree from Youngstown State University. She received her Master of Public Health with a concentration in prevention science from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Thank you for joining us, Allison. Tonight's disclosures include Dr. Pack's disclosures of royalties from up to date and NIH funding. Moving on to tonight's webinar. Um, tonight's webinar aims to help you better understand your diagnosis of epilepsy, be able to better explain to others what type of seizures you have, allows you to better manage your medications and your schedule, and shares the importance of implementing behavior changes to avoid triggers for your seizures. We also hope to make sure that you know when to request referral to an epilepsy specialist. And finally, we hope to give you the information you need to help you ed educate others around you about the best way to respond if you have a seizure. At this time, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Pack. Dr. Pack, thank you so much. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction and um, setting the stage for what should be an exciting uh, discussion this evening. I'm going to start off by talking, again, starting off with the basics. What are seizures and uh, how do they start? Well, within the brain, there are many, many billions of cells, and they communicate by sending and receiving electrical impulses. What is a seizure? Well, a seizure occurs when there's abnormal and excessive electrical activity that temporarily interrupts normal brain function. It is important to recognize that every brain has the potential to seize. Individuals, however, do have different thresholds. It's also important to recognize that not everyone who has a seizure has epilepsy. 
There are non-epileptic seizures, that is, people who have other conditions such as fainting spells, withdrawal from alcohol, etc. Next slide, slide, please. So what is epilepsy? We've just discussed that any brain can seize. Well, when is an individual diagnosed with epilepsy? Epilepsy is diagnosed in a person who is at risk for recurrent seizures. Formally, it's an individual who has multiple unprovoked seizures or an individual who has an unprovoked seizure and is it has at least a 50% risk of having another seizure. Recognize that it does not indicate the cause. It does not indicate any prognosis. And there are many different types of epilepsies. Amongst people with epilepsy, there are many different faces, many different ages. Next slide, please. So anyone can be affected by epilepsy. It affects all ages, races, as well as socioeconomic groups. Individuals at particular risk, though, include children younger than two years of age and adults older than 65. Recognize that epilepsy is more common than many other neurologic conditions, such as cerebral palsy, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis combined. That is, the number of individuals who have epilepsy are more than all of those neurologic conditions combined. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the numbers. The numbers are actually quite daunting. You recognize that many people have epilepsy. So let's go through these numbers. Three million individuals, that is three million who are 18 years of age or older have active epilepsy in the United States. 470,000 17 years or younger have epilepsy in the United States in 2015. Worldwide, there's 65 million. These next statistics are quite interesting. One in 26 people in the United States will be diagnosed with epilepsy during their lifetime. So if you think back to the days, if any of your students, or if you think back to the days of sitting in a large classroom and you look around the room, many individuals in that classroom are at risk, will be di potentially diagnosed with epilepsy. One in 10 people will experience a seizure during their lifetime. These numbers highlight that individuals with epilepsy are not alone. It's also important to recognize that in 60% of newly diagnosed um, epilepsy, the cause is unknown. For many people, uh, it, patients as well as practitioners, this can be frustrating and certainly why we all work together to better understand epilepsy. Next slide, please. So what do seizures look like? And this can be very confusing for many people. Many people, when they think of what a seizure is, one image comes to mind. That is the individual who collapses, sh shakes, and is unaware. And this is the image that's um, often portrayed in our media, such as in television or in the film industry. But seizures can look many different ways. They can be a staring spell, a muscle twitch or spasm, difficulty speaking, confusion. Some seizures have very few outward signs and can be very subtle, such as a funny sensation or an unusual spell. And for many people, that is the people who have seizures, people witnessing individuals who have seizures, or even practitioners, this variability of presentation can make it hard to actually diagnose these events as seizures. Seizure symptoms and signs of seizures do vary from person to person. But in most cases, they're consistent and predictable for an individual. And this is very important when you have an individual, for example, who may have multiple types of symptoms and think that these are, those are seizures. But usually for most individuals, they are stereotyped, consistent, and predictable. Next slide, please. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about the diagnosis of epilepsy in individuals with unprovoked seizures. Well, let's talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. 
Well, a provoked seizure is, can occur due to a, can, an acute condition, such a, a considered situational. In this set setting, abnormal electrical activity in the brain causes a seizure in the setting of, for example, drug or alcohol intoxication, head trauma, if somebody has an acute bleed in the brain, um, a stroke, fever. These are all situations whereby the seizure, or that is this abnormal electrical activity, is provoked by a specific event. Unprovoked seizures occur for unknown reasons. They may occur in relation to a pre-existing brain lesion or a progressive nervous system disorder, but there's no inciting or clear inciting event where that resulted in the seizure. And when thinking about the diagnosis of epilepsy, we think about it in individuals who have, as I said earlier, recurrent unprovoked seizures or a single unprovoked seizure, and they are at risk for another one. Next slide, please. So let's talk about treating the first seizure. The individual has their first seizure, and they want to understand, well, should I treat this seizure? Um, so what leads to that decision? And it is very individualized, and multiple factors are, are reviewed and considered um, when making that decision. So I've alluded to this a few times earlier. What is the seizure recurrent risk? What is the impact and the impact of recurrent seizure? For many of us in practice, we use the 50% mark. That is, if the individual has a 50% chance or greater as determined by prior brain injury, um, history of head injury with loss of consciousness, an abnormal EEG, an abnormal neurologic exam, or others, we would choose to treat if it was greater than 50%. If it was less than 50%, and the impact of recurrent seizure was not high, we may not choose to treat. It is important, though, to factor into that decision patient concerns, preferences, as well as side effects from uh, potential treatments. Next slide, please. How does one make the diagnosis of epilepsy? There is no single test used, and this is something I go over with my patients um, repeatedly. There's no one test. It's not as if you um, are worried, say, you're concerned that you may have a particular infection and you send off a blood test. There is no one test to diagnose epilepsy. I would state in my practice, and for many of us in the field, the most critical piece is the history taking the time with a practitioner to review the events of what happened, to trying to determine whether it was indeed a seizure, and as I, have as I have referred to repeatedly, what the risk of a recurrent seizure is. Medical and neurologic exam are very important. Individuals, for example, who have an abnormal neurologic exam, their risk of a recurrent seizure is greater. Blood tests can be used and imaging, such as CT and uh, the more sensitive um, brain MRI. EG, EG um, is useful in helping where we look for abnormalities to determine whether that individual is at risk for a recurrent seizure. And in some patients, we do video EEG monitoring. So you can see there's multiple tests and multiple uh, studies that we use to determine whether an individual has um, epilepsy. But I want to reiterate the most important piece of the diagnosis is really the history and working with the practitioner who takes the time to review what's happened and, um, and other salient or other pieces of the history that may be helpful in making the diagnosis. Next slide, please. There are different seizure types, and we've referred to this a little bit earlier, whereby seizures can look different. So not only um, do seizures look different, but they also can come from different parts of the brain. Seizures can be focal, that is coming from one part of the brain. 
generalized or unknown, very hard to tell. We, when, look, when thinking about seizure types, we want to understand whether or not a person's awareness is affected. Does the individual have other symptoms during their seizures, such as movement? So the um, other symptoms will help us, particularly in an individual who has a focal seizure, determine where in the brain it may be coming from. Next slide, please. Now, the language of how we refer to seizure types has changed, and this uh, can be very frustrating. Uh, for individuals who have seizures, for those of us in the field, um, and when teaching medical students, they're confused. Why did you change the language? So let's go through how we refer to um, seizures now. And in many ways, um, I think the, the way we refer to seizures is actually a little bit more intuitive. It makes, and in some ways, it makes more sense than um, terms that we used before. So as I said uh, previously, there are focal seizures and generalized seizures. When thinking about focal seizures, as I said, these are seizures coming from one area of the brain. When I am classifying or naming a focal seizure, it's important to understand whether awareness is impaired or not. And what I mean by that is, is the individual fully aware? Do they have full memory of the event? For example, an individual who has subtle findings such as sensory change but can talk through it and is fully aware of what's happening. Or is the individual impaired? That is, if they were given a memory item, they may not remember that. They may have no recollection as to what happened. So that is uh, one differentiating point when looking at focal seizures. We then further classify them as to whether there's motor or non-motor uh, features, so motor, such as clonic movements, repetitive jerking movements, and um, non-motor, uh, we referred, talked already about sensory seizures. And then does that seizure progress? Does that seizure start as a focal seizure and move on to a bilateral tonic-clonic seizure? Other terms that have been used in um, the past to describe this that many of you may be familiar with include, include grand mal or secondary generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Now that we refer to them as focal, evolving to bilateral tonic-clonic. And then as we discussed, there are generalized onset seizures. Again, awareness, classifying whether the individual is aware or not is important. Are these seizures tonic-clonic? Do they have motor manifestations, non-motor? The classic example of a non-motor generalized seizure is an abson seizure or, or another term, petite mal, staring spell. Those are other terms that are used to describe that. And then unknown onset. These are seizures where the, we can't determine whether they're coming from one area or focal onset or generalized. And these seizures also can have motor, tonic, clonic, other motor or non-motor uh, clinical manifestations. So these are the terms that are being used now to refer to seizures. Um, these terms help us, um, and they're important to understand because not only is it important to understand the type of seizures, but also the reasons why. And when one understands what type of seizure uh, an individual has, uh, building on that is potential reasons why or etiologies. Next slide, please. So when is it not epilepsy? Um, this is something that comes up a lot in practice. Our, an individual presents, have symptoms that they are concerned is a seizure, and the testing is done. The history, as I have talked about earlier, the testing is done, and um, the individual doesn't have um, epileptic seizures. Well, there can be physiologic explanations, other physiologic explanations as to why an individual has an event with or without altered awareness. Some other potential um, physiologic explanations include syncope, which is uh, the heart, whereby the heart, for example, is not, the brain is not getting the oxygen or blood supply it needs from the heart and the individual may pass out. 
um, or lose awareness. Uh, migraine headaches. Migraine headaches can be the great masquerader of a lot of different things, and there are complex migraine headaches whereby individuals not only have pain, or in some cases they may not even have pain, and they have other um, neurologic symptoms to go along with it, and those can seem like a, an epileptic seizure, but they're not. Cardiac rhythm disorders, sleep disorders, individuals who may have jerking, for example, in sleep, maybe restless leg syndrome or maybe um, sleep onset myoclonus, See, looks like a seizure but is not, and then other movement disorders. Psychogenic. These are seizures that, that are occur. They look some of them look like seizures, but when you do EG testing, there is no associated epileptiform brain activity. Um, the events are often atypical. There are features that um, are not wholly consistent with epileptic seizures. It is very important to recognize, though, that these events are not at the conscious level. Years ago, a term that was used was um, it was um, pseudo seizures, and that is not a term we use anymore because I think it really has a very negative connotation and has the concept of it not being real. And for individuals who have these, they're not at, they're often not at the conscious level, and the individual cannot control them. Similarly, to an individual not being able to control epileptic seizures. And there is often an associated history of um, trauma or abuse. Next slide, please. So let's now talk about triggers. What is a seizure trigger? A trigger is something that occurs consistently, um, resulting or making it more likely that an individual will have a seizure. Triggers include behaviors or situations that can increase the likelihood a person will have a seizure. Some people are able to identify triggers, whereas others are not. Keeping track of when seizures occur and what was happening around the time of the seizure can help identify possible um, triggers. Recognize that the most common trigger for seizures is missed medications and working with your practitioner to come up with strategies to avoid missing medications is very important. Next slide, please. So common triggers include poor sleep or lack of sleep, stress. Stress is something that patients have been talking about for years, and for years was often dismissed by practitioners. But, but it, those of us in the field recognize that negative and positive stress for many individuals is a trigger, and indeed there are nice studies now supporting this. Alcohol or drug use, some individuals, particularly individuals who have generalized epilepsy syndrome, can be very sensitive to um, alcohol use, and that is more likely to have seizures. Hormonal changes, there are women who have seizures at certain times of their menstrual cycle, most commonly ar around menstruation, but ovulation can also be a, a sensitive time. And again, this is uh, an area where patients for years were saying, I, it's occurring around my period, and many practitioners were dismissing it. But certainly now, um, we, all, we, all, it's, we recognize that, and it is important to understand that that is a trigger. Illness. I saw a patient today who had been seizure-free for over three and a half years and in the setting of a febrile illness and poor sleep had a seizure. For some individuals, flashing lights. Not everybody, but some individuals flashing lights can be a trigger. And some prescribed or um, over-the-counter or herbal medication. Please talk to your practitioners when thinking about taking other medications or prescribed by other practitioners. Next slide, please. Why is it important to identify these triggers? Well, knowing the triggers can help you. So the patient I uh, saw today we talked about what we would do in the setting if he had another febrile illness like that. Um, we talked about you can use um, boost the medications individuals are on, use rescue medications, which is what the patient and I talked about today. Avoiding those stimuli. Um, 
And as I said earlier, the most common cause is uh, missing medication. So it's very important to come up with strategies that uh, whereby you do not miss your medications. Next slide, please. Reflex epilepsies. <clears throat> Some individuals have what's referred to as reflex epilepsy. And these are seizures caused by specific sensory inputs. Keep in mind, this is not everybody, but there are certain individuals that have this. Common seizure triggers uh, elicited by sensory input um, are flashing or uh, flickering lights, geometric patterns, and individuals who have this, who have an EEG with the uh, photic stimulation, that is a way to recognize it and individuals at risk for that. For some individuals, music, certain types of music or a specific pitch, reading or doing math calculations, loud noises or unexpected touch that are startling. These are sensory inputs that can elicit seizures in individuals who have reflex epilepsy. And as such, it would be important for those individuals to avoid, avoid those sensory inputs. Individuals, uh, for example, who are um, sensitive to flashing or flickering lights when in bright lights, particularly in certain situations such as they're driving, either as a, a driver or a passenger in a car with trees, whereby the lights are flickering in, those individuals in those circumstances would want to wear dark uh, glasses. So understanding the triggers and avoiding them would be important. Next slide, please. Keeping, identifying your seizure triggers, uh, diaries. You know, as, as silly as it sounds, diaries are really important. Keeping a diary, write notes. It can either be in a paper journal or online journal. There is an electronic tool, um, epilepsy.com slash seizure diary. What, what was I doing at the time? Was I up late? Was I excited about something? Um, did I drink too much? Was, was there lights, noise? Were there any triggers? Was it a certain time of my me uh, menstrual uh, cycle? And share these diaries with your doctor and work with your doctor. Take action. Try, for example, if there are certain behaviors that, uh, that <clears throat> are triggers and provoke seizures, work on with your doctor to come up with strategies to avoid those. And enlist your family and friends. Have them help you avoid triggers. You know, alcohol use, for example, is so common in our culture. And there, for many individuals, there's a lot of pressure to drink. Well, if you're an individual whose seizures are elicited by alcohol use, you're going to need to work with your family and friends, particularly if you're around people who um, like to drink and may want to have you drink with them. It's important for those individuals to recognize that that is something you would need to avoid. So support uh, with, of your family and friends is very important in avoiding these triggers. Next slide, please. How do we treat epilepsy? Well, the mainstay of treatment are anti-seizure medications. Other terms to describe these are anti-epileptic drugs and anticonvulsants. The goals of therapy, I always describe the seesaw when I'm talking with my patients. On the one side, no seizures, but we can't ignore the other side. We need a balance, and the other side is side effects. It is very important to understand whether you may be susceptible to side effects of some medications, and certainly if you're having a side effect, you need to work with your practitioner, communicate with your practitioner to say this is not acceptable. We're in a, an age now where we have well over 20 anti-seizure medications and not one medication, one medication does not fit all. And recognizing, as I said, that seesaw, that balance, no seizures on the one side and no side effects on the other. That is the mainstay of goal of our medical therapy. Next slide, please. Most people will have controlled seizures. That is 60 to 70 percent of individuals after treatment with the first or second anti-seizure medication will have controlled seizures. There are, however, 30 to 40 percent who have uncontrolled seizures. And in these individuals, the epilepsy is disabling. They may have frequent seizures. We talked about side effects. And we cannot ignore the long-term impact of the seizures. 
Next slide. So when thinking about your medications, what do you need to know? Well, it's important to know the name of the medication and the dose. Is the medication a uh, generic or a brand? You know, uh, the brand names are often much easier to read and know than the generic names. But, you know, for many individuals, the insurance won't cover the generic. And luckily, we do have studies now with some medications, particularly Lamotrigine or Lamictal, where there's studies showing that the brand is um, similar um, bioequivalence and efficacy to multiple generics. What formulation are you taking? Are you taking a regular acting or a long acting? I had a patient call today where we had prescribed a long acting uh, preparation because the individual did not uh, had side effects on the short acting. The pharmacy, however, gave the short acting. So it is important to know, am I on the short acting or the long acting? What is the dosing schedule? Is this something I take once a day, twice a day, or more? And in fact, the dosing schedule is something to think about when prescribing a medication. We talked about compliance and how taking medica missing medication doses is a common trigger. Well, if you're an individual who will not remember to take a medicine two or three times a day, that needs to be something you work with through with your practitioner. You may want to go on a medication that's longer acting. That is, you can take it once a day or go on a, a long acting preparation of another medication. We talked about side effects. When thinking about medications, not only do you want to talk about or communicate to your practitioner a side effects you may be having, but it would be important for the practitioner and you to talk about potential side effects that you may be at risk for. For example, many individuals who have epilepsy um, also have uh, mood disorders such as anxiety or depression, and some of our medications may exacerbate that or make it worse. Well, that would be very important to understand you know, I am a very anxious person. I have a lot of anxiety. I wouldn't want to put an individual like that on a medication that would potentially make that worse. How is the drug metabolized? Is it metabolized through the liver or the kidney? If it's metabolized through the kidney and the person has renal failure, well, you may want to avoid a medication like that or dose it only less frequently. So um, that is, they wouldn't need as much of it because it would, was being metabolized more slowly. Safety in pregnancy is very important. Some of the anti-seizure medications ha have been shown to have adverse effects in pregnancy on either physical outcomes or teratogenic effects or on cognitive outcomes in the children who are exposed to that. So it is really important to know that I'm on a medication I'm a young woman, I want to have a child, is my medication safe for me to take in uh, either actively now while I'm pregnant or for future pregnancies? Doses may be needed to be adjusted. And will the insurance cover the cost? You know, I said earlier, we have over 20 medications, many of which have become available in the past 10 years, some of which are a lot more expensive. And that may be a good medication, but if I can't afford it, then that is not, that has to factor into the decision. So all of these different um, things are important to know um, about your medications and for the practitioners to understand when prescribing a medication. Next slide. What is drug-resistant epilepsy? Well, we talked earlier about how most people are, are have well-controlled seizures. That is 60 to 70% but about 30 to 40% don't. So how, how, is it user, how do you define drug-resistant epilepsy? Drug-resistant epilepsy is an individual who has failed <clears throat> two adequate trials of, well, of tolerated and appropriately chosen medications. And that's important because statistically, once an individual has been treated with an adequate tolerated and well-chosen medication and continues to have seizure after the first and the second one, statistically, the chances of those seizures being controlled with medication drops dramatically. 
goes from that 60 to 70 percent to 10 percent or lower. And it be, it's these individuals where we have to intervene, we have to review the diagnosis. Does this individual indeed have epileptic seizures? Are there other things that we should consider for treatment? And this is often and preferably done at an epilepsy center. Next slide. And you can see on this slide here certain factors that we've talked a little bit already about already with triggers that may lead to um, treatment failure, including poor adherence, sleep deprivation, hormonal changes, or substance abuse. Next slide. Well, what is an epilepsy center? That's a term, that's what we talked about that um, on the two slides ago. Epilepsy centers are accredited through an organization called the National Association of Epilepsy Centers. These centers need to meet certain criteria in order to get this accreditation. Um, they provide both inpatient and outpatient comprehensive care. And there are epilepsy specialists at these centers. These are people like myself. This is, as I say, this is what we do all day long, every day. We diagnose, evaluate, and treat epilepsy. Next slide, please. Within an epilepsy center, there's a team. There is epileptologists, that is neurologists who specialize, nurses, neuropsychologists, individuals that work with us to better understand um, the cognitive functions. For example, many patients with um, seizures may have memory problems. Neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, neuropsychiatrists, EG technologists, social workers, and case managers. All these individuals work together as part of the epilepsy team. And this can occur in both the adult and pediatric setting. Other options for individuals who have refractory epilepsy is surgery. Diet therapies, devices are available. Um, it's an exciting time now with neuromodulation. Uh, we have the vagus nerve stimulation, which has um, been around for a number of years. But more recently, we have respons responsive neurostimulation, that is the RNS device and deep brain stimulation, that is DBS. And there are other investigational medications. You know, despite all these different medications we have, there's still about 30 to 40% of individuals, as we've talked about, who still have seizures. Are there other medications? And we're constantly, individuals in our field are constantly trying to do better and come up with other strategies or medications to treat seizures. And as we've touched on already, managing the triggers. Next slide. Epilepsy surgery is, um, as I said, is considered in individuals who have refractory epilepsy, that is, they have failed two or more anti-seizure medications, and, um, and they have focal seizures coming from one area. Um, unfortunately, it's often perceived as a last resort. Um, and many individuals, when you look at the studies, the average length of time that an individual gets referred for surgery, that is having refractory seizures, it's really frightening. It's 20 years in the studies that have been done, and unfortunately, that has not changed. The, um, and as I said, um, many individuals often perceive epilepsy surgery as a last resort, but can be, for appropriate individuals, life-changing. Next slide, please. Um, less than 1% of individuals with medication-resistant epilepsy are referred to epilepsy centers. I talked already about how the average length of time it takes an individual to get to surgery is about 20 years. Um, approximately 100 to 200,000 U.S. patients with intractable epilepsy are eligible for surgery, but only 2,000 to 3,000 surgical procedures are performed annually. Clearly, we as a community need to do better. Next slide. There are risks of uncontrolled seizures. They can result in physical harm, accidental death, and also sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Each year, about one in 1,000 people with epilepsy die from sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. This risk may be lower in children, and for any of you who may have known of someone, I've certainly taken care of patients who have 
died um, secondary to this, it's one of the more horrific things that we deal with in our field. The greatest factors, uh, risk factors for sudden unexpected death and epilepsy are uncontrolled seizures and generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Um, recognize that high doses of anti-seizure medications can increase short-term and long-term side effects, and also they can have a most social, emotional, um, and I'm sorry, uncontrolled seizures can have social, emotional, and financial impact as well. Next slide. Um, there are other comorbidities, things that can occur in individuals, uh, migraine headaches. I touched a little bit of earlier about how many individuals um, have um, emotional disorders such as uh, depression or anxiety, developmental delay, injuries, um, sleep disorders. There are many other things that can occur in individuals who have epilepsy. Next slide. So one thing that we've talked up through as we've gone through our uh, uh, discussion this evening is that the importance of communicating with your doctor. You and your doctor and the other individuals who may be part of your medical team are working together to get your seizures under control, to minimize the side effects, to think about other therapies um, if medications are not working. Also, remember your nurse and pharmacist are very good sources of information. Get to know your pharmacist. This will be very helpful in better understanding your medications and avoiding errors such as what happened to that patient of mine today. Next slide. And be prepared to share. Think about who needs to know about your epilepsy. What is important to share? Consider who you're telling and prepare for their response. You know, this is something that you may or may not want to or need to share, and certainly be prepared when you do share to answer the questions individuals may have. Next slide. And seizure first aid is important. Um, it's important to um, review with your doctor and understand what to do in the setting of um, seizures. Stay calm, make sure the individual's safe, turn them to their side, do not put anything in their mouth, do not restrain them, and stay with the individual until they are um, alert. Next slide. And with that, I turn it over back to Dr. Kiria Kapos. Thank you, Dr. Pack, um, <clears throat> for that um, really comprehensive review of key epilepsy information um, that people can use to build their knowledge around their epilepsy and empower themselves to engage in their medical care and advocate for the best health possible. I'm so thrilled uh, to have with us tonight Alison Kukla, who will share with us her perspective on her epilepsy journey. Alison will provide her thoughts on how building her knowledge about her diagnosis of epilepsy and engaging in her treatment decisions and the epilepsy community has led her to feeling empowered. Alison, thank you again for sharing your time and insights with us this evening. Uh, it would be terrific if we could begin with you sharing with us a little bit about you, how you enjoy spending your time, and some of your incredible accomplishments. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, so the slide right here is just kind of a brief overview of the, some of the things you know I like to do. I like to stay active, running, yoga, biking, currently training for the Chicago Marathon in October. Um, you know, in my career, I've worked in both politics and public health. I've worked on Obama's campaign, and which led me to the White House in seven years and his administration, which was absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I like to advocate for different issues, epilepsy, of course, but, you know, recently volunteered for a school board race here in Norfolk. Um, and also the photo on the top right, I like to mentor. Um, a lot for young people with epilepsy because I didn't have that person when I was first diagnosed. So I stay in touch with Virginia up there and, you know, just letting them know, like, don't let your epilepsy define you and, you know, don't ever let it hold you back from things that you want to accomplish and do. Thank you, Allison, for um, for sharing. Um, it would be great if we could spend some time discussing your epilepsy journey, starting right back at the beginning with sharing your perspective on receiving a new diagnosis of epilepsy. Yeah, 
Yep, I was diagnosed, um, like was previously stated, my freshman year of college in 2006, and I still have active epilepsy and have the focal impaired awareness seizures. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I couldn't stop thinking, like, you know, what does this mean? Like, this big, scary thing, like, that I haven't lived with. And, you know, I was away from home at the time. I didn't want my life to change because I was finally away at college. And, you know, I had more questions than answers. And I didn't really want to tell anyone about it because I didn't want to be treated differently. But it definitely was staying in my life. And I had to figure out how to deal with it. Can you share with um, people listening what resources have been helpful to you in learning more about your seizures and managing your epilepsy? Um, my care team would probably, number one, being able to answer specific questions that I have about test results, medications, side effects of medications, um, just having that open communication with them. Um, my fiance, who is also my caregiver, um, he helps at appointments. He remembers what the doctors say because my memory can be iffy at times. Um, the internet, but to clarify, only credible sources. Do not go down the rabbit hole of Dr. Google when you know Googling side effects or things like that. You know, pay close attention. Go to the Epilepsy Foundation uh, website. Other epilepsy organizations are all super helpful in the information that they provide. Um, and one of the biggest ones I found is support groups. Kind of going back to you know meeting other people with epilepsy and learning from them and how they've handled situations you might be facing or you might face in the future such as you know being a young woman with epilepsy talking with moms who have dealt with epilepsy and their care those are great uh great tips that you've offered uh to everyone can you share a little bit about any hurdles um, that you felt were hardest to bypass in becoming an informed and empowered patient? Yeah, like I've mentioned now a few times, that first hurdle was meeting someone with epilepsy. When I was first diagnosed, I found my local um, epilepsy group in my hometown, and it was a bunch of people my parents' age. So I kind of like thought, okay, <laughs> only old people get this <laughs> disease. And, then I found someone probably about six years after my diagnosis that I could talk with and relate to. Um, and then another hurdle, just kind of not knowing what to ask my care team about, just having that lack of um, education. You know, if I don't know something, I don't know. I should be asking about it, such as, you know, the epilepsy referral to an epileptologist, which I just saw my first epileptologist this past November. And what, what sort of value has being seen by an epileptologist at um, an epilepsy center brought to your treatment? It's been amazing. It's been a ride these couple months with tests and whatnot, but um, I'm receiving my care at University of Virginia and I got referred there. Um, we've learned through the various tests that I've gone through that one slide that we had with how you diagnose epilepsy. I've had every one of those tests now and then some it seems. Um, but we now know where my seizures take place in the brain and we're waiting to hear if I'm a candidate for surgery. So it's just been, you know, the information has been invaluable that we've gained from seeing an epileptologist at the epilepsy center. It's great that you're um, at a center where you feel like you're getting the very best care. It's so important. Um, can you share your recommendations for people who feel that they don't yet understand their diagnosis or treatment? Ask questions. Um, that is definitely the best way to start learning. You know, talk with your healthcare team, ask for materials or any recommended reading that they have or resources to just kind of dive in and learn everything you can and then come up with those questions too and bring them back to them. Um, also ask your team if there's someone you can talk to between appointments, because I know with me, you know, those questions always come up like after you're home from the appointment, you're like, oh, I wish I would have asked that or I forgot to ask that. So kind of what Dr. Pack was saying, like make those relationships with the nurses, because I know they've been extremely valuable in, you know, learning and having that relationship with them. Can you share with everyone what tools you use to help you keep a record of your treatment and the impact that it's having on controlling your seizures? Yes. 
um, a pill case. I know I have the giant AM PM pill case, but it definitely shows you if you've missed any medications, which as Dr. Pack mentioned is, you know, one of the biggest triggers. Um, I'm old school and I keep a Word document as my seizure tracker, you know, to identify maybe a possible trigger that could have induced a seizure, tracking any medication changes that are being made. Um, it did that actually had two seizures this past Friday and updated that document to show like, you know, I'd gotten poor sleep and, you know, it was kind of stressed. So maybe those were causes. And I know that's helpful for your care team to have. Um, also my Google calendar, just to keep track of appointments and coordinating that with my fiance since I don't drive. Um, but what's most important is finding that system that works for you. Everyone's different. What works for me might not work for you. And, you know, there's great online tools, like we had mentioned, Epilepsy Foundations, My Seizure Diary, um, and just really test stuff out and see what's best for you to keep track of the important information that you need for your appointments. Great, and um, that's terrific advice uh, to share. Can you share with um, people listening how you find support in the people that are closest to you and how you try to prepare them to respond to seizures if they happen? Yeah, so a perfect ex example is from last Friday. Like I said, I had experienced two seizures, which is uncommon for me. Um, I was at work. I was with, you know, one of my good friends that I work with or has become a good friend at work and trusted to tell her about my epilepsy. And so she knew exactly what to do and realized what was happening. We were out to lunch for the first one. And I just remember coming out of it and asking her if we had paid the bill yet and then promised her I didn't have the seizure just to get her to pay for that. <laughs> um, but just, you know, having that support network outside of this friend, it's my fiance, family, friends, uh, local support groups that I attend here in the area, just, you know, really building that network and finding those people that you trust and then telling them what you know, just the importance of educating yourself so that they're comfortable and prepared to respond in case something happens. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, to share a little more with us because you're giving us such great advice. Um, wondering if you can share with us how you are best able to direct your epilepsy journey to maximize your health and maintain the best quality of life possible. There's a lot in that question, but I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I was saying earlier, like don't let epilepsy get in the way of things I want to do or goals I want to reach. And, you know, that's a lot. It can living with epilepsy can be really frustrating. And, you know, having those days where you're having seizures and you don't want to do anything. But I try to stay positive and optimistic about it. You know, working on my triggers of getting enough sleep. Um, and you know, there's always gonna be stress, but trying to manage that through yoga or meditation. Um, and then, you know, just being active really helps my quality of life. Having that time of just running or yoga or like anything, really being in nature to just kind of have a break um, really helps me and, you know, hopefully decreases my seizure activity. <laughs> That's great. And, you know, it's important to think about um, those, the balance of those things, right? So avoiding triggers, but also finding things that uh, have a positive impact on things from day to day. And it's great that you shared what works for you. Um, it can help people think about what might work for them. I just want to say, Allison, your impact as an advocate for people living with epilepsy is incredible. Uh, I wanted to ask you what motivates you to lend your voice and your talent and your time and your heart uh, to this work uh, because you're so involved and we're so thankful to have you uh, with us tonight for sure. Yeah, well, thank you. That was very kind of you to say. Um, but it really comes, I haven't always wanted to talk about my epilepsy. So if I can be the voice of someone who doesn't want to talk about it yet, I want to be that voice. People did it for me and it's a way of paying it forward to others. Um, also, if I can be that first person with epilepsy a newly diagnosed person talks to, I want to be that person. I don't want to say I love being that person, but I just know how much it means to someone. So if I can be there, I just love being there for people. And, you know, overall, my motivation is really personal since I'm a person with epilepsy. 
as I look back at my journey, I found areas where I wish I, you know, could have been improved for me in my care and education and all of that. And I want to make a living, you know, make living with the condition and learning about it easier for those who are newly diagnosed or, you know, trying to figure out how to best live with the condition and address those areas that I felt um, during my care and so far with the condition, you know, and just overall being a set of ears to listen. Just having someone to listen is huge when you're having those days where, you know, you're having seizures or side effects and, you know, just being there and having someone there is, you know, really true motivation for me too. Allison, uh, I know for many people listening tonight, you have made things easier. Um, thank you for your candor and your insight and the encouragement you bring to people who are still finding their voice as they begin their journey with epilepsy or for those who are struggling with the challenges that epilepsy can bring. We're so fortunate to have you on the Epilepsy Foundation team as a leader and an inspiration. Uh, thank you for all that you've done to empower others, and I know that you'll continue to do. Uh, thank you again for being uh, here with us tonight. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So at this point, we'd like to end this evening's webinar sharing with you some resources to help you continue to learn about your epilepsy. Uh, speaking with your physician or nurse is always a good place to start, as both Dr. Pack and Allison have pointed out to us. Keep in mind that referral to an epilepsy center may be necessary for you to uh, be able to help determine if your diagnosis is correct and what treatment options are best suited to help you control your seizures. You can also find up-to-date information on epilepsy.com. Help guiding you to additional resources, you can call into the uh, Epilepsy Foundation's 24 7 helpline and reach out to your local Epilepsy Foundation office. They can help to provide you with information, resources, support, and can also help to direct you to an epilepsy center close to your home where you will find medical providers who specialize in the diagnosis and treatment of epilepsy. I would like to take a moment to thank Dr. Pack and Allison Kukla for sharing with our epilepsy community their time and their knowledge. I would also like to thank each of you for joining us this evening and hope you will continue to join us throughout 2019 as we aim to provide you with learning opportunities that help you answer questions and guide you to the resources you need to manage your epilepsy well.